Boy, we sure do have a picture-perfect day to do some exploring today. I'm going to continue my series on exploring small sections of the Appalachian Trail. Day hike distance. Um, we're in Crawford Notch, New Hampshire. Looking up at what I believe is Mount Wiley or Willie, W-I-L-L-E-Y. And um, the Appalachian Trail is heading kind of west from here or southbound in general direction. And I'm going back into what's called the Pemigewasset Wilderness, which is just outside of the Crawford Notch State Park and part of a much larger park, which is the White Mountain National Forest. Um, there's some waterfalls back here. There's one right near the trailhead here, Ripley Falls. We'll go check that out first. It's early in the morning, about 7.15. Days are long in June here, so we've got plenty of daylight to explore. My goal or turnaround point today is going to be Thoreau Falls, which is about five and a half miles on the Appalachian Trail. Um, basically in a westward direction. So we're southbound on the Appalachian Trail, but we're heading west in the actual compass direction. We'll be looking up at these mountains today. Um, the trail doesn't go over a, a peak at this point in the trail going southbound, but if you would head, if you're head northbound from the Crawford Notch, it goes up what's called what's called the uh, Webster Cliffs. And we should get a view of those today somewhere along the way. So let's go check out some falls. There's some natural lakes back here and some incredible what's called boreal forest where there's all kinds of northern trees, spruces and larches that become common as you go up in elevation in the White Mountains. And um, it's supposed to be a very scenic area and probably less traveled than some of the areas around here, especially on a Sunday in June. When the shade is so deep this time of year under beech trees. There's a lot of beech in the understory back here. Uh, beech bark disease is prevalent in the White Mountains, but fortunately the beech leaf disease, I haven't seen any yet. Been up here a couple days now. And that beech leaf disease caused the leaves to shrivel up and get all deformed. And uh, you lose your shade. Blue Blaze Trail off the Appalachian Trail to Ripley Falls and points beyond. We're just going to go to Ripley Falls today and then continue to the right here up the mountain towards the Ethan Pond Shelter. And um, that's right off the trail as well. And then we'll uh, keep going westbound basically in direction towards Thoreau Falls. Let's go down here and check out the Ripley Falls first though. And the Blue Belay side trail to Ripley Falls pretty much is on the level, slightly uphill in places, but you don't have to do a lot of extra climbing or descending to get to the falls. That being said, we have to scramble down to the falls over these boulders, but uh, not a lot of net elevation loss or gain. Well, the sun is just high enough to illuminate these falls, as you can see by my shadow here. A lot of boulders to scramble over to get to the falls, but not that difficult. Boy, that sure is pretty. So, I'm sure there's times where there's a lot more water coming across here, but it's still enough to make it pretty interesting. Beautiful uh, evergreen, Samalox, white pine, maybe a little spruce framing this in. And a little bit of a pool at the bottom. I'm sure you could wade in there at least. I don't know if it's deep enough to swim. Certainly a good place to cool off. Got some warmer weather coming this week. I'm sure people will do that. And it's just about a 10 minute walk back from the falls, Ripley Falls, to the 
Appalachian Trail, which on a lot of the signs is called Ethan Pond Trail, which is where we are going, one of the places. So don't let the signage confuse you. It is the Appalachian Trail. They've got that um, in parentheses here. And the white blaze right up here to indicate that. And up we go. That white blaze right up here on this uh, looks like a sugar maple tree. So from what I've read, you got your northern hardwoods, your birches, yellow birch, paper birch, sugar maple, American beech. Um, at the bottom of this mountain, and as you get up around 2,800 feet, 2,900 feet, you get into what looks like a boreal forest, which is what a forest would look like in many parts of Canada and even Alaska. So we'll uh, record that when it comes along. Meanwhile, the land use history is obvious here by the amount of paper birch I'm seeing. When you see paper birches, in quantity, it always means the land was either logged, burned, or both, or cleared for other reasons. But plenty of paper birch back here. So you're definitely not in uh, first growth forest. If you start finding a lot of either dead or deceased or standing paper birch. And we've um, ascended um, probably about a thousand feet in elevation, not too steep at any one time. Just above the trail, the Ripley Falls, there was a lot of wooden steps, um, wooden uh, pieces of wood across the trail that made steps. It wasn't a staircase, but just moderate climbing, nothing too steep, nothing too stony, no scrambling required. And yes, there was all kinds of paper birch down there. Like every fourth tree was paper birch. Now that we're getting near the um, divide between the streams heading towards the Saco River, Saco Saco River, and the streams heading towards the Pemajawasset and Merrimack Rivers, we're in that divide area. I think we've lost a lot of that paper birch and we're into some trees that you tend to find in older woods. And this understory tree here that's just amazing to look at any time of year that it's got foliage. This is a uh, witch hobble, which gets 10, 15 feet high. Get some beautiful flowers in May, early June. I don't see any right now. I think they're past peak. Maybe later on we might see some if we go up a little higher. Those flowers become these little green berries, which eventually turn um, an incredible red color. And some other trees that let me know this is older woods is we've lost almost all the paper birch but there's lots of yellow birch to take its place so yellow birch grows in a forest with lots of um you know it's, it's an older woods they're slow growing trees this one here is about two feet around it's still kind of yellowish bronze in color with curling and furling bark, but the curls and furls are much smaller than that of the paper birch. And we've got a really big one down here. If the yellow birches get big enough, they lose their curling and furling. And I've recorded these before on other hikes. I, think I was up in Crane Mountain, New York last fall. Found some really big ones up there. Well, this guy's so big, it lost the curling and furling, and it's all just plates. Probably hundreds of years old. And uh, I can tell this yellow birch by the upper branches still have the curling and furling. I can tell by the leaves this time of year, if I can see them. And um, so yeah, the yellow birch, lots of it here. We've lost the paper birch. We've got plenty of this witch hobble at all levels, foot level, waist level, and eye level. And that means older woods, but I don't expect to find all older woods on this hike. Much much of the east branch of the Pema Jawasset River had a logging operation up until 1940. So where they could reach with those logging cables and mules before that um, would determine how old the trees are. 
and 1.6 miles from where the Appalachian Trail crosses Route 302 is where we're standing right here. This is um, one of several trail intersections we're going to come to today. This trail also goes down to Route 302, and I could do it on the way back to see the Kendron Flume, or Kedron Flume, but I'm not sure if there'll be enough time um, that would make a loop. And um, we've actually come 1.3 miles because where I parked for the Ripley Falls was a 0.3 mile um, road that dead ends by the on the way to the falls. So I've done 1.3 so far plus 0.8 is 2.1 miles. The 0.8 is back to the um, falls, over to the falls and back. So um, we'll keep on hiking. Our next stop will probably be the area around the um, Ethan Pond, which is supposed to be very scenic. At that point, we will have done all the climbing and we'll be on our way gradually back down towards Throw Falls. And just a few tenths of a mile above the turn off the Kedron Flume, we're at another interchange. This goes up Mount Willie, which is the one we saw at the very start looking up at it. It looked like it would have a great view. That might be for another day. And our trail, which is also called Ethan Pond Trail, Appalachian Trail, in parentheses there, keeps going to the left here. And then here's the trail mileage back to Route 302. Boy, and looking up, so definitely looks more like a boreal forest here with lots of um, spruces and balsam fir. And um, leveled out, there's a lot of that bog bridging like I showed in the last video. Um, and spring, you know, this is June 16th. It's almost summer by the calendar. Meteorological summer started two weeks ago. But as you go up in elevation, spring takes longer to uh, come and go. This is a flower you often see in bloom in May down in the lower areas. But at almost 3,000 feet, it's in bloom right now. This is our blue bead lily. It's got these beautiful leaves at the bottom. I've seen quite a few of them. Some uh, dwarf dogwood in bloom up here, too. I have a feeling we'll be seeing a lot more of that today. So there's your dogwood flower. Almost identical in appearance to that of a flowering dogwood. And the foliage resembles that as well. But it's a little smaller. There's my thumb for scale. And it's a ground cover. It's not a tree at all. It's in the same genus as the other dogwoods, even though it's just a ground cover. And the interesting thing about dwarf dogwood is it's circumpolar. It finds habitat to its liking throughout the polar and boreal regions of the Northern Hemisphere from Eastern North America, West through Siberia, and right into Northern Europe. Here's another blue bee lily. You can see the yellow on this a little better. That last one was more of a pea green. So they do get a blue bead. Looks like a little, like a bead you'd make a necklace out of, about the size of my thumbnail. And um, those will be forming as the summer goes on. We're getting closer to um, Ethan Pond. We're going to stop there and take a look at it. We'll be looking at any more wildflowers and, point, and plants or views as we go along here. But boy, lots and lots of this blue bead lily right here. I just saw dozens of it. Right there. All kinds of these pink lady slippers right along the trail here. Again, a few weeks ago, these were in bloom the lower elevations. So, spring uh, 
takes a few weeks to get up this high and even longer to get to the tops of the mountains. I was hiking here many years ago around the um, Mount Geo area in mid-June and still found snow on the north facing slopes underneath the fir and spruce trees. Um, don't know if I'll find any here today at this elevation. I wouldn't expect any, but I wouldn't be surprised if some of these north facing slopes up higher still have some snow. And about 2.3 miles from the parking lot for Ripley Falls. We come to the turnoff for Ethan Pond campsite. There's a lean-to back there as well. And just dozens of these dwarf dogwoods along the trail today. It's like having a dogwood tree that's laying down on the ground. So here's our turnoff here. We're just going to go down and take a look at the pond. And then keep going towards Thoreau Falls. We're about halfway in distance, but we've done all the climbing. We actually have to gradually descend to get to Thoreau Falls. So two and a half miles, it may not take that long. Depending on how much I stop to record. Here's our turn off to Ethan Pond Shelter. Boy, have we been blessed with blue skies today. Everything looks so interesting with skies this blue behind it. So, um, you're not going to go wrong on a day like today, no matter where you hike. Everything's so green and so blue. And here's Ethan Pond. We just got over to it in just a couple minutes from the Appalachian Trail. I think the trail actually gets close to it as it goes west from here. But I wanted to get the view that I knew was here before I continued on. So, they do have a um, rock bridge across the inlet, or yeah, the inlet to the pond. They've got some stones in place here barring any beaver dams to raise the level of the pond you'd be able to get across this here's our inlet and looking up at the slopes of mount wiley excuse me mount willie that was about a one and a half a 1.1 mile walk from where we left where, where we joined that trail but it was quite a bit of climbing as you can see over 1,200 feet higher than the uh, pass where, where the trail um, originated. And then looking west and southwest into the Pema Jawasset Wilderness. The White Mountains aren't known for having lots of lakes. There's a lot of mountains here and a lot of streams. This reminds me more of some of the views you get in the Adirondacks where lakes are very, very common. So, um, and Maine has lots of lakes too along the Appalachian Trail. So this is uh, sampling the Appalachian Trail and boy, I'll tell you what, this trail section we're doing to Thoreau Falls has many side trips you can take if you have the time, including up Mount Willie there and to Ripley Falls and just a lot to see within a short distance of the trail. And it's just, it's a really neat feel back here. It's a, definitely a boreal forest. I'm starting to see some larch, um, plenty of black spruce and red spruce. We'll look at those as, as they uh, come closer, but we got to keep putting the miles behind us too here. So um, this is Ethan Pond. We're looking west, southwest. Boy, it almost looks like something from a Dr. Seuss book. The top of this black spruce tree where there's no branches to speak of for quite a distance and then this big bushy top of the tree so black spruce and red spruce grow out here um that's an exaggerated form of black spruce but i don't think i've ever seen a red spruce look like that so often black spruce grow close together enough that the lower branches shade each other out and they only have foliage on the top there's one right back there. And often the lower branches are still on the tree, but they're they're dead. They just haven't fallen, like right here. So this area is wet and soggy enough. It has black spruce. Normally black spruce in the northeast only grows in boggy areas and at tree line, which we're not near right now. We're a couple thousand feet below tree line. But it has these dull bluish green needles that are much shorter 
there's my thumb for scale then those are red spruce Yes, and this forest is almost entirely black spruce. Again, look at the tops of these trees. They're straight, they're narrow, and they tend to have a lot more going on at the top than on the sides. So, um, I haven't been to Alaska, but I believe there's parts of Alaska where the forest looks like this. Um, because black spruce does grow all the way out to Alaska, across Canada. And um, larch does as well. And the balsam fir, I haven't really studied that today as on this hike, but it grows out to about the area just east of the Rocky Mountains in Alberta. But there's other types of fir that take over at that point. So, um, not too crowded on this stretch of the Appalachian Trail today. I don't know about through hikers. If they started early enough, they could be up this far. Um, and if they're coming southbound, they certainly could be coming through here. It's probably, you know, about a month's hike from Mount Katahdin into here. So, certainly possible, but haven't seen any today. Seen a couple backpackers, two groups of backpackers, and a couple day hikers, but on a beautiful day like this, I only not even need, I only needed one hand plus an extra finger to count the hikers so far. This is a great trail. To take if you're looking for just a different feel than just the straight up and down and less crowded than some of the straight up and down trails around here and the trail just continues gradually downhill towards Thoreau Falls this is the second deposit of this um, animal scat that I've found and at this point I think it's worth recording okay those are about the size of my thumb. Too big to be deer scat. The fact that they're in spheres or, you know, they're watermelon shaped. I'm guessing this is from a moose. I know it's not from a bear. I know it wouldn't be from a mountain lion. So I'm deferring to what it could be, and that's probably a moose. I have seen moose up in Maine when canoeing, but I've never seen their droppings. But there's a lot of it along the trail here. So a lesson for me, I'll have to look that up when I get internet. No service at all back here, and that's just as well. It's a wilderness area. And um, we'll have to look that up to get a positive ID. Put that on there when I do the editing. But um, I wouldn't mind seeing a moose while hiking. I've never only ever seen one while canoeing. I just don't want to run into a moose that's uh, being aggressive. So um, we will see what comes along today. I wouldn't, you know, again, from a distance, I think it would be pretty interesting to see. I've heard stories of people having problems with the moose while hiking the Appalachian Trail, especially the males. So uh, be careful what we wish for, but interesting to see their evidence nonetheless. And we've come about a mile and a half past the uh, turnoff to Ethan pond shelter and campsite and uh, boy more of this black spruce you can see how the tops of the trees look so much different than any other tree and this is growing in a pretty wet area where you would expect to find them at this part of the country the bog bridging is okay in most places Right here, most of it's missing, and there's some spikes sticking up. So, um, if you chose to do this hike to see the falls, and it rained a whole bunch, and the water table was really high, you might need some bog boots to get through this area, if you don't mind carrying them. I'm not having any trouble with my hiking boots. It's not that wet. It's more just muck. But these spikes here, you need to be aware that they're here, because they could hurt you. If you're not paying attention. Alrighty, well, we've come almost a couple miles from Ethan Pond. We're getting near the next trail junction. 
which goes back to Shoal Pond. And we're collecting a lot of water. And this is called the North Fork of the East Branch of the Pema Jawasset River. I just looked at the map. So um, just to be geographically accurate, that's what this is called. And we're going to go look at it in a second here. Well, this false hellebore, it's kind of interesting to look at. It kind of looks like corn growing a little bit. It's pretty tall. Usually that means really damp soil. And, boy, that sure is pretty. These are just little flumes right here, but it's just so pretty on a day like today. Nice big swimming hole there. And you know, mountain water is cold, but if it has a chance to sit in the sun like that on these ledges, it warms up at least a little bit. So um, certainly feel good on a hot day. So this is kind of what we're going to be seeing at Thoreau Falls, but a much larger ledge, obviously. So we'll keep recording these little, little waterfalls as we approach Thoreau Falls and then take a real good look at that. I can say that white blazes on this section of trail are almost non-existent, except where really needed, like at trail intersections. Um, so, but you're not going to find too many other trails to confuse you that aren't marked. So we have made it to the junction of the Shoal Pond Trail, which I don't think there's going to be time to explore that today, but it's supposed to be a beautiful pond similar to Ethan Pond, similar size with similar beautiful views. That might have to wait for another day. And then we've got just a half a mile to get to Throw Falls. And um, I don't need to be back on the trail heading out or back to the car till 2 o'clock. So we've got plenty of time to explore that. It's a little after 12 now. Um, I'm budgeting four hours to get out for a five and a half mile walk. Because of all the bog bridges and... Um, some knee issues I've had over the years. I don't try to do more than two miles an hour, but with the bog bridges and rocks, I really can't. I have to do like a mile and a half an hour. There's our white blaze, but there haven't been too many of them here. So I'm budgeting four hours to do five and a half miles without taking too many videos. And on the way in, I, you know, it took longer and that's okay. I allow time for that. I started at 7.15 this morning. So part of hiking in a wilderness area or anywhere really, but especially if you're getting where there's not a lot of help, you got to have a plan as to what your turnaround time is, how much your body can handle, how much daylight you have, and obviously the weather forecast. And um, try to work within your limits. I did Amanusik Ravine up to Mount Monroe a couple years ago in the fall when there was only 10 hours of daylight. Started right as the sun was coming up and finished right as the sun was going down and had a set turnaround time that day because of the lack of daylight. Today it's more I just need time to eat and get my rest for the for tomorrow's hike, which we will see if I can do it, but I think I'm gonna be able to do some hiking up in the Tuckerman Ravine area tomorrow. 30% um, chance of a stray shower in the morning. Um, I think that would not be enough to keep me from going up there, but if it's all socked in, I'd do a different hike instead. Okay, as you're sneaking through all that thicket there, all of a sudden, here's a bridge across the north fork of the east branch of the Pemajawasset River. And obviously during snow melt and times of heavy rain, you would need this bridge. Especially because of the steep gradient of this stream. It would wash you right away, even if you tried to ford it. So it uh, wouldn't be a problem today to wade it or rock, even rock hop it, but um, the Appalachian Trail is a through trail, and um, in many places a lot of effort has been made to avoid tragedies of people trying to ford streams that really shouldn't be forded for many times of the year, at many times of the year where they're running high. So um, sure is pretty here. Boy, um... Most of these are red spruce on these less wet areas, so a beautiful red spruce forest here. 
Um, the wetter areas with the bog bridging was mostly black spruce, a little bit of tamarack, and uh, some balsam fir. So we've made it to our destination, almost. We're on the Appalachian Trail. This is also called the Ethan Pond Trail. We need to take the Thoreau Falls Trail just a couple tenths of a mile over to the falls. So the Appalachian Trail will get you here, and then you just take this trail just a short distance to the falls. Um, for what it's worth, this is a no camping area within a certain radius of the falls, and they've got that demarcated. Um, I did see a few campsites outside that radius that people probably had used. So we're going to head on over to the falls. We'll start recording again when we get there. And... Um, Started at 7.15, it was five and a half miles on the Appalachian Trail plus 0.8 on the Ripley Falls Trail. So it took me five hours to get here to do six, a little over six miles. And that was taking a lot of time to record video. So I think four hours is plenty of time to get back. Um, so we'll hang out here for at least an hour, hour and a half. Try to get out on the ledges where there's more breeze and less black flies. Right now they're buzzing, they're not in not being really aggressive there's not a lot of them i did put some deep woods off on this morning and they aren't biting me except that one of them got me in the finger where i hadn't sprayed the insect repellent and um swelling up like a bee sting but it wasn't a bee sting but it's fine it doesn't bother me so yes hiking in june and may you got to be prepared i do have the long leg covers if I need them. I'm in shorts today. And same for my arms if I need them. If the bugs were to get unruly, I'd put those on. I've got a head net. If they get unruly, I'll put that on. And I've got snow pants in case the weather got really cold on me. I'm always prepared for winter type weather in the White Mountains, even though it's usually not necessary on a day this perfect. I try to respect the mountain and respect all the effort that's been made to rescue people off these mountains that weren't prepared and i don't want to be one of those persons that has to get rescued so i'm carrying extra weight for that reason but those snow pants obviously i'd be sweating terribly inside them but it would keep any bug from biting me if the bugs were trying to um, bite through the base layer which is pretty thin And the Thoreau Fall Trails does uh, lead right to the top of the falls. There used to be a bridge here, from what I've heard, uh, that no longer exists. But actually, today, a rock hop would be feasible. Maybe not every day, though. So, if you're interested in doing that trail, be aware of the water conditions and plan accordingly. So, yes, this is the trail right here, and it does cross right here on these boulders. So, looks pretty feasible right now. I'm not going to try it, because the view... I want is right here, looking upstream. All these potholes. Beautiful mountain water is so clean. It's a little tea colored, but it's so clear. This is the Ford right here. It doesn't look that difficult. And then. The falls really begin right here. You can see the pink granite here. It is pink in color where there's no uh, weathering. It's got some little white, or excuse me, black flecks of minerals. And then the uh, pink and the white as well, the feldspar and the quartz. I think the black is horn blend. It just kind of bleaches to a white color here, but it's definitely pink where it hasn't ble ble bleached. So we're in the granite state, and granite is what we often find, but not everywhere. Um, the Mount Washington area itself is actually metamorphic rocks that used to be ocean sediments. So, um, yes. So this is mostly igneous rocks right here. Makes a beautiful setting. It can't do it justice with the camera. I'm going to try anyways. Do a little scrambling around and get some different vantages. Meanwhile, looking west and northwest, we got Mount um, Guyo, G-U-Y-O-T. 
That's the one where I found snow this time of year back in the 80s when I was hiking it. And the Z Cliff Trail, Z Cliff area is right through there. That is part of the Appalachian Trail as well. So if you were to continue southbound on the Appalachian Trail, you'd be crossing this ridge in the background here. Well, like many other places we go to on hikes, you have to really come here to appreciate these falls. You really can't get it all in one photo or in one video, but I'm doing my best. This is the lower flume, and then around the bend is the upper flume. And there's supposed to be even more flumes down below here, but that would be a lot of rock hopping. Um, I'm gonna just hang out here for a little while. I don't need to try to go any further at this point. But what an amazing place. That looks like a pretty good swimming hole down there. I was able to crab walk my way down these ledges from the top. With the weather today and the rocks being dry and the river being not too full, it was within my ability. The crab walk, I mean, on all fours, uh, carefully scooching my way down the steeper sections. What an amazing hike. Definitely day hike distance for this area. Not too many people back here. I've seen a few hikers. One was a through hiker that was doing a third of the trail. So I still consider that a through hiker if they're going hundreds of miles. And he was heading northbound. So um, what an amazing place. We're going to eat lunch here. I'll try to do a few little videos on the way back. We'll get out the trail map and plot our course. And definitely not a navigational challenge to get back here. Every intersection was marked. So um, even though there's not a lot of blazes on the trees, you really don't need them. And I've scrambled back up the uh, sloping granite ledge of Thoreau Falls. And this is the view from the very top up the stream a little. And there's some more flumes just above here too. So it's not just one falls, it's a, it's a whole network of them. Let's look at the trail map. Got plenty of time to eat and uh, enjoy a beautiful early uh, summer, late spring day. We'll look at the trail map here while we have the time. This hike started in the Crawford Notch State Park, which is this big area here, which is the Crawford Notch itself. Um, which is a geological formation. The Appalachian Trail is in orange here. This is a National Geographic map of this area. Pretty helpful. Shows a large area, so the little details might be elusive, but um, definitely helpful for trip planning, and it's helped me today as well. I didn't need other maps, this was enough. We started at the Ethan Pond Ripley Falls parking lot, just off of Route 302, but there's parking down there for Webster Cliff, it shows, and just up the road there as well. So uh, get there early if you want a spot. I'm sure by the time I get back to my car, they'll all be gone. If They probably were all gone. I think by the time I get back, they may be some available again. But we came up just a short distance, two tenths of a mile, to the turn off the Ripley Falls, four tenths over, four tenths back. Uphill, but not strenuous, really. This was pretty moderate. Several side trails to the Kedron Flume and Mount Willie. And then made it to Ethan Pond. Take a good look at that. Made some videos there and just kept going west. So all the interchanges were marked. There's white blazes where needed, but there aren't a lot of them on this stretch of trail. I've mentioned that before. We had a side trail that continues down into the Pemigewasset Wilderness um, that goes to Shoal Pond and then just keeps going. 
And then shortly after that, we got to the spur trail to Tarot Falls right here, which had a clear sign. It's, it's only a five minute walk at the most from the Appalachian Trail down to Tarot Falls. I showed where you have to ford the river there and it looked doable. And then that trail continues down into the wilderness even further. So it's a great place to sample the Appalachian Trail. Does not require extreme mountain climbing skills. Has a lot of scenic rewards. It's quiet back here. And it's just a pretty hike. Again, after heavy, heavy rains, that boggy area with all the bog bridging might not be that much fun, but today it was no problem. Where the bog bridge was falling apart, I was just able to get around it in some muck, but it wasn't over my boots by any means, just a few inches deep. So a great place to explore. Bring your bug spray if you come in June, though.